let's pray. Father, we do thank you for Mother's Day, and we do honor you for the mothers who give of themselves to raising offspring. Lord, the role they perform is just phenomenal. And so, Lord, we do want to thank you for our mothers and for mothers that perform that role in today's world. Lord, thank you for them. And as we look at your word, Lord, give us wisdom to see. Give us hearts to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. I just wanted to begin with this because I think it's true, isn't it, that our mums must have had a Superman outfit in the closet to do what they did so well. So we are really grateful for our mothers. And thank you so much for joining us today on a very difficult topic. We are continuing with our theme on Christian hope of an eternity with God. The Christian hope of an eternity with God. So the concept of eternity is not in question, for eternity is with all of us, but it's how we will spend eternity. And for the Christian, of course, it's that we will be in Christ and therefore in God. And if we remind ourselves of Romans chapter 6, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we know that eternal life is a gift and it's a gift that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, this gift cannot be earned and it's not deserved. It cannot be earned, it's not deserved. It is just a free gift. And I think that's the foundation of today's talk, if we can bear that in mind. Now we think of an eternity without God, and that is the focus of today's talk. Not a pleasant subject to talk upon, but yet a reality that we need to face. And in order to highlight this and to begin this part of the talk, let's focus a little on Paul's uh, discussion with uh, the people in Athens. Athens was a city where there were lots of idolatry, there were lots of gods being made and produced, and people were into all sorts of different types of religions and faith expressions. And there was one particular idol which Paul came across, which had an inscription on, which read, To the Unknown God. And so Paul uses this and he helps the people understand that there's only one God, and that is Jesus. And he ends, in a sense, this discourse with the people at Athens saying, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So there is a fixed day, the second coming, the judgment. And we are grateful that this judgment is performed by a righteous God, a righteous judge. We would hate to fall into the hands of an unrighteous or a corrupt judge. But here is a righteous judge. And the resurrection, that assurance, is both that there will be a judgment, but for the Christian, hope in that judgment. Paul is saying that God is knowable, discernible, discoverable. I don't think these are real words. I've just sort of made them up. But God is revealing himself to us all the time. In fact, this is God's mission to the world. He is revealing himself constantly. And we are invited to be a part of his mission to the world to encourage everyone everywhere to repent because there is a day fixed on which God or the Lord Jesus will judge the world in righteousness. And so our role is friendship, friendship with the world. It's evangelism. It's sharing our testimony. It's not telling people that we go to church that may be helpful, but that's not what it's about. It's about Jesus. And that's why we spend so much time looking at people's testimonies. How did people come to faith? Because it is that which helps people to see the Lord Jesus. It helps people to recognize that God's not unknowable. He's not hiding away. He's all around us. And so our friendship 
evangelism is what really matters as we talk and share what Jesus has done for us, how he has forgiven us, how he has blessed us. And so how we talk about the Lord is really important. And if we don't talk about the Lord, well, then there's a problem. And so our testimonies are absolutely crucial in our joining with God in his mission to the world. Because we do not want anyone to experience an eternity without God. Why would we? The question is asked, what form will the judgment take if we know the judgment is certain? Well, we're told in our reading today, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Judgment, separation, two groups, not three, winners and losers. Now, this is a very difficult concept in a modern society because we are so bound by terms such as inclusive, accessible, and we don't want anybody to fail. And so we try and do away with assessments, exams, appraisals, reviews, because we want everybody to pass that finishing line. And our schools now present prizes to everyone who competes in the race, not just to the few who win. Is this good? Is this bad? Well, it is wonderful to be inclusive and accessible, and that is what we need to aspire to. But the kingdom of God does have criteria for entrance. The criteria for the separation comes across in the second commandment that Jesus highlighted as absolutely crucial for us as Christians. The second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Serve other people as though serving Christ. Love the unlovely, those who are our enemies, love them. Those who are different to us, reach out to them. Those who hurt us and malign us, forgive them. It's about relationship. It's about caring. That criteria used is demonstrating forgiveness and grace. Not our forgiveness and grace, but God's forgiveness and grace. As we feed, as we give a drink, as we look after the stranger, we are showing that God knows these people by name and cares about them. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the criteria that will be used at judgment. How have we loved our neighbor? And this criteria runs throughout the Christian tradition. In recent years, though, the Christian church has delegated, I would hope to say, and not abdicated, the role of caring for society. So, for example, we have delegated the education of people to our schools and universities. We've delegated the care of the sick to our NHS and the medical provision. And so we've we delegated the care for the homeless to homeless shelters and voluntary organizations. We delegated the care of providing food for people who are hungry through the food bank. So the church has taken a little bit of a back step and a sense delegated that, but in nevertheless still concerned primarily about the care of those around us, loving our neighbors as ourselves. We see that when Jesus said these words, there was a response. In the righteous will answer Jesus, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry? When did we see you naked, thirsty, in prison? But Jesus is addressing the righteous. The righteous will answer. Because you're reminded in Ephesians that all by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. In other words, it's not the works, the good works. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, the good works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created 
in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The first and greatest commandment is that we should love the Lord our God with everything we have. We are called to receive the gift of faith and the life that comes through Jesus alone. Our faith is in Jesus. Acceptance of his rule and his reign in our life is what really matters. It's only in Christ that we can find righteousness. It's only as we put on Christ and therefore his righteousness that we will find ourselves at that judgment throne asking the question, Lord, when? Good works follow. But good works are not a currency for an eternity with God. Only the righteousness of Jesus is the currency that is acceptable. But good works are incredibly important, for they are the second commandment. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. And so we cannot separate the two out. But one cannot be without the other. We look at the judgment on the unrighteous. Matthew tells us, then he will say to those on his left, those who did not have the righteousness of Christ, those who are not clothed with Christ, those who are not in Christ, he will say to them, part from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The unrighteous are those who deliberately, willfully, habitually, continually refuse to turn to Christ, to accept Christ, to acknowledge Christ. But this fire that Matthew talks about was never prepared for any human being, only for the devil and his angels. It was never meant that any human being should land up in this predicament apart from God. But it's about consequences of choices or not choosing and therefore defaulting to the realization that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And only in Jesus will we have the righteousness and that eternity with God. And so it is an awful thing for judgment on the unrighteous, for they will be separated from God, an eternity without God. And I was thinking about this. I thought, let's do a contrast. Let's think about what does eternity with God look like first? The best example I could think of was the story of the prodigal son. He had rejected his father, he had rejected his home, he had rejected all that was good. And he went off and did his own thing. And that's a picture of you and me. We've just wandered away from God. But when the son was yet a great way off, returning back to his father, his father saw him. God saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Can you imagine that picture? That is the fate of the righteous. That is what we want for everyone, especially family, friends, neighbors. And even when they're a great way off, as they just turn in repentance, that the father runs to them with compassion, falling upon them and kissing them, welcoming them in. Eternity with God. How we long for that all people, all whom we know. But conversely, an eternity without God. Well, I thought the best way to see this is Jesus on the cross. And he cries out. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli. Lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And we know at this point that all our sin, the unrighteousness of us all, 
was laid on Jesus. And God had to turn his back. Our holy God had to turn his back on God. And so Jesus felt that abandonment. He felt that small time of an eternity without God. The agony. And so an eternity without God is so painful. And so we need, as Christians, respond. And how do we respond? The iconic picture on the side of the slide is uh, depicting Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in communion, in perfect communion, in holy fellowship. And if we remember the picture of Jesus on the cross, that was the only time ever that Jesus was separated from this trinity, from this community, from this unit, as it were. And so how do we respond? How can we love our neighbours as ourselves? How can we show our love for God? Well, let's be sure that we are clothed in Christ, that we have his righteousness. And that's a simple task of saying, Lord, I believe. I believe you are Lord. I cannot earn my salvation. No good works I perform can ever make me good enough to receive that gift of eternal life. Secondly, we pray for those who are not yet in Christ. Folk, prayer is so important. God hears our prayer. And so we're praying for those in our neighborhoods, our families, friends. Lord, please reveal yourself to them and help us to be there for our friends, as friends, sharing our faith story. And that's why that faith story is so important. How did you come to faith? How did you come to know Christ as Lord? That's what we need to share, because as we share that, we're participating in the mission of God, which is that all men should be saved and come to a knowledge of salvation. And so we partner with Christ, not through our good works, although those are very important, but through sharing our faith story as we do good works. So let me pray for us. Father, our hearts cry out as yours does for a world that is turning its back on you and Lord especially those who are close to us whom we know are struggling to believe to see to come to that point of being clothed in Christ Lord would you have mercy on them would you hear our prayer for them would you give us our testimony our words to share how precious you are to us with them would you give us, Lord, the eloquence, the simplicity to share our faith? Because, Lord, we long for all people, as you do, to spend that eternity with you. In Jesus' name. Amen.